വാസുദൈവായ So we're living in very interesting times. A lot going on in the world. And I I saw a a video yesterday. Um it was in a, in America in Washington DC. There was um a statue there of Abraham Lincoln and celebrating the emancipation of the slaves. And there is this movement <clears throat> in America and spreading around the world where people want to see an end to all forms of racism that is a very noble desire that is very virtuous but unfortunately there's a lot of other things simultaneously going on so at this monument there was an elderly um black gentleman who worked as a guide around all the historical spots in Washington DC and he had a couple of friends with him also and they brought along he brought along his bullhorn that he uses when he takes guided tours explaining what all the different things were where they came from what's behind them so he was there objecting to the idea of pulling down this monument and he made the point that in fact the monument was paid in its entirety by money from black slaves they put it up there to celebrate what had happened and you have this crazy mob insisting on pulling it down is the virtuous thing to do that it's this is the virtuous thing to do we need to do this really badly and the guy was just standing in front of this woman she was obviously you could tell by the way she spoke she was highly educated a black woman also and she was just going crazy like screaming and screaming at this older black man yeah. and he just quietly kept saying the same thing who paid for it who paid for it and she was just going like i don't care what you are <laughs> and just going like completely insane and as sort of you know that Uh, that moment is just like incredibly disturbing and clearly demonstrates that many of us are not really guided by true wisdom not actually knowing what is virtuous what is the right thing to do and it made it it made me immediately reflect on on a passage from the great epic so i'm calling this an epic lesson the great epic the mahabharata the mahabharata is one of the great vedic epics and it deals primarily with uh, this five principal characters then they were they they were known as the pandavas they were five brothers their father was the former king and he had died when the boys were very young and so his the dead king's elder brother who was blind and therefore considered not um capable of actually ruling because you can become misled um assumed uh, became the regent and assumed you know control of the kingdom until his nephews came of age that was meant to be the plan 
but uh, this blind regent's own sons were really vicious people and they plotted to kill their cousins and attempted to assassinate them while they were young, young children. It was like, wow, just like so horrific. And so they had to basically flee along with their mother and, and become beggars and hide, traveling from village to village, just begging for food uh, because their lives were in imminent danger. So uh, time passed and they grew and they were extremely skilled warriors. The eldest brother, his name, I know you're going to have a hard time with this one. His name was Yudhishthira. Yudhishthira was, was, this guy was like amazing. He was a fierce warrior king. He was profoundly spiritual. He was like a, a saintly king. He was deeply loved by everyone that knew him. So, um, Eventually, they came of age and they came back to claim their kingdom. And everybody was surprised because they thought they had been killed in this fire. They built a building, a palatial building to house them and then set it on fire, thinking that they would kill them, eliminate them. So here they showed up and it was like, whoa, massive shock. And they asked for the kingdom back. And it was kind of like a really difficult situation. So after some prolonged negotiation, the blind king who was really influenced by his sons who were really quite savage individuals, um, agreed to give them part of the kingdom and they would keep part. And the part they gave them was this crappy place. It was like semi-desert and you know, it was like really bad. But because of their very virtuous and, and saintly nature, when they took up residence there, rain began to fall for the first time hardly ever. And the place soon became very prosperous and, and beautiful. And many people who were living in the bigger kingdom gravitated towards this place because they really wanted to live under the protection of these really, these incredible um, brothers. So uh, their cousins were now plotting, how, how are we going to get rid of these guys? So they had some very curious things. In, in the way in which society was organized, different people had different sort of um, responsibilities. And with those different responsibilities came a code to live by. And the great warrior, they call in, in Sanskrit, chatriya, these great chatriyas, things that they were not allowed to do. They were not allowed to, to turn down a challenge. If anybody challenged them, they had to accept the challenge and compete, whether it's in armed combat or whatever. And any, anyway, this was just one of the codes that they lived by. And so the, their cousins enticed them to come visit them and then sprang this trap where they challenged Yudhisthira, knowing that he was so pious and he was so truthful and honest that he, he would not back out. So they challenged him to a game of gambling using a f kind of dice they have in India. It's different than the, the cubes, you know, longer. So uh, the one who challenged him, his cousin, didn't even play. He had his uncle, who was this real corrupt guy. I mean, he was bad news, had him play for him. And so being able to manipulate the dice well, he enticed Yudhisthira by first placing bets and then Yudhisthira has to counter. And they, they ended up losing everything in this, in this game. And still, he would, not, he would not let them go. He said, you know, you're one last game. 
And they said, we, we have lost everything. They were sitting there in their underwear. That's how bad it was. Everything was gone. And it was like humiliating and shameful. And, but rather than just giving into emotions, because they're guided by a code, they decided, you know, they, they knew they had to patiently endure this. And so uh, the last challenge was that uh, he, he, well, the second to last, he said, I've got nothing more to gamble with. And he said, how about your wife? We'll gamble with your wife. And everybody was like, ah, like shocked. But because of this warrior code, he had to go along with it. And, and he ended up losing his wife. And then she was, this was like a big royal assembly of men. And the only women that would go in there were like entertainers in these kind of assemblies, uh, prostitutes or dancers or, you know. And so she was dragged into the assembly. And as the final humiliation, they attempted to disrobe her since they supposedly, these guys owned her now. And so, I mean, the degree of humiliation that they went through was just like unendurable. It was like absolutely horrific. So they, they were given now a final challenge that we will play one more game, and this time we're doing everything. If you win, you get everything back. But if you lose, you must go into exile for 13 years. And in the last year of your exile, if we find you, you have to continue the exile for another 13 years. It's just like, you know, you couldn't even imagine how wicked people could be in wishing harm and hardship upon someone. And of course, they played the game and, and, and lost. When um, the wife of Yudhishthira, Draupadi, when they attempted to disrobe her and, and failed in their attempt, um, one of the Pandava brothers was so infuriated, he, he rose up and he promised that he would kill the cousin that was doing this. And he said, while he's still breathing, he will tear his heart from his chest and drink the blood. And it was like, whoa, whoa, are you serious? You know, it was like so, it was just like incredible. And everybody, their hair stood on the end. It was like so um, horrific. The whole situation was just totally out of hand. And of course, they ended up losing and then had to leave and go into exile. When they walked out of the, of the palace, heading towards the forest, all the residents of the city cried and begged to come with them. And the king, Yudhisthira, told them that you cannot come because I cannot provide for you and I cannot give you shelter. And people just absolutely wept. So they're in the forest. They're there for about 13 months. And after 13 months, it's just kind of like they can hardly endure this anymore. But the, the elder brother, Yudhishthira, is, is so patient and he is taking advantage of the time. It's like, this is like serious lockdown. <laughs> and he's taking the time to meet with um, saintly sages and great yogis and to engage in discourse and to learn from them. And he, he very much loved this time. But finally, his wife could not handle it anymore. And she broke down both in tears and in great anger and asked him, how is it um, that, you know, this has all happened due to the evil schemes of these men. And they have caused us so much pain. How can you just sit there? She said, myself, when I see you sitting in the dirt, when you used to sit on royal thrones and your brothers having to beg 
for food or gather whatever they can. He, she said, it, it absolutely breaks my heart. And to think that these evil persons who manipulated this situation are living in a life of luxury, I, I cannot tolerate it. And she, I was planning to read, I'm looking at the clock and it's like the time's clicking by, but this is really nice, yeah? We like this stuff. So um, she, she spoke for quite some time. And um, after begging and pleading and asking him, how can you do, is, is, isn't there something wrong with you and something wrong with your thinking that you can be so tolerant? Why aren't you angry? Because it would be righteous for you. It would be virtuous for you to be angry in this situation. Why don't you become angry? And why don't you rise up with your brothers and go and attack these evildoers and set right that which is wrong? So Yudhisthira, so I'll just read a little bit. Yudhisthira looked with compassion upon his wife. She had suffered so much, and if anything stirred his heart, it was her suffering, for which he felt he had been the cause. Yes, his heart still burned when he thought of how she, had, she was dragged into the assembly hall. The pain of that moment would stay with him for the rest of his life. But this was not the time to make war. Draupadi could not understand the entire situation. And he replied gently, O oh, intelligent lady, through anger we may sometimes gain wealth or power, but anger ultimately destroys mankind. Real Prosperity crowns one who conquers anger and brings adversity to one whom anger controls. I'll just read that again. Real prosperity crowns one who conquers anger and brings adversity to one whom anger controls. Anger is the root of all destruction. Any angry man commits sin blindly. An angry man will even kill his respected preceptor and insult his elders. He cannot distinguish between right and wrong. There is nothing an angry man might not say or do, even to the point of sending himself to death's abode. I mean, you see these things where somebody becomes so angry and they don't even care if they get killed just to try and prove a point. And it's kind of like, that's madness in the extreme. I do not indulge in anger, Draupadi. Rather, I will strive to control it. Draupadi listened respectfully. She knew her husband's grasp of morality and spiritual principle was unsurpassed. He was capable of instructing even the demigods. Sitting on a simple mat of kusha grass, Yudhisthira continued, A weak man is oppressed by one more powerful. He should not display anger, lest he bring about his own destruction. There is no blessed regions in the hereafter for those who destroy themselves. Thus the weak should always control their anger. Only fools praise anger, considering it equivalent to energy or strength. The wise keep anger at a distance. The man consumed by anger does not easily acquire generosity dignity, courage, skill, or the other attributes possessed by men of character. The wise consider him a man of character 
who restrains his own wrath. The pious always praise such a man because they can understand that the forgiving man is always victorious. One who represses his anger, even when antagonized, rejoices in the hereafter. For it is said that a wise man, whether strong or weak, and even if in difficulty, should always forgive his persecutor. So um, I may end up continuing with this next week because there's a, there's a lot to it. He, he speaks about forgiveness. He speaks about what is true virtue. And don't, don't misunderstand. You know, a few more years into the exile, his brother, one of his brothers was just such an, he was a powerful individual. The one who said he would rip the heart of the guy out of his, out from his chest while he's alive. He, he was just like wanting to go and, and, and do the right thing and was just harassing his elder brother. And Eudistir was sitting with sages, meditating and had been engaged in discourse. And this time he turned with this fierce look and he told his brother, it is not yet time. When that time comes, even you will fear me. So in saying that, it's not like these guys were wimps. It's not like they were looking for an excuse not to fight or to be brave. They were heroic. And they ended up in this monumental, catastrophic battle where so many people died. So much so that this king felt that he could not take the throne because it was at the cost of so many lives. But if we step back, if we're not locked up in our own uh, kind of like little world we've built for our value system, like the, the lady I mentioned at the monument screaming at this older black man, and she's black herself, and she thinks the guy has been an absolute idiot and is condemnable because he's saying you shouldn't take that down. You need to respect the people that put it there. They were slaves and it was from their own pocket that they paid for this. And tearing that down is not gonna change anything. It's gonna make the world a, a worse place, not a better place. But she's on a mission. She's got her own idea of virtue and what needs to happen. And she's just screaming and ranting and overwhelmed by anger and emotion. One of the great lessons in the whole yoga process is do not, do not make decisions, do not speak, do not act when you are in a heightened emotional state, whether a positive or negative emotion. If you do that, misfortune will follow, unhappiness will follow. One must really learn how to calm the mind, to step away from things and consider really objectively what is the right course of action? What is in my real interest and this person that I'm dealing with in their real interest? What is going to make things better? And then choose a course of action and speech that actually makes things better. And of course, that means that one will be guided by eternal truth, by real spiritual principle. Okay, was this cool or what? Are we good with this? I, I, it's such a shame because our time is so short. This is an amazing story and there's so much intricacy to it and so many levels and layers. So I may, I may um, do a little bit more of it next week and we can maybe have a bit of discussion. If you, if you have any, anybody got a question on this? Yeah. We have one online. You have a question online. Okay. Can you please mention how Drupadi was still with her husband if he had lost her in the game? How what? How Drupadi was still with her husband. How she would? 
How she was still with him. How she was still with him. After she'd been lost in the game. B- because part of the whole deal was she would accompany them into exile. They decided they didn't want her. They thought she was a witch or something. They tried to disrobe her, but her clothes just kept manifesting. It was kind of like some mystical thing going on. So everybody just kind of, oh, whoa, 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 this. <laughs> she's a witch. <laughs> and it wasn't like that at all. <laughs> so we won't speculate about what could have happened or might have happened. Um, that is what happened. And she was, she was angry and bitter that they had allowed that to happen. But she did not reject them because she understood what were the circumstances that didn't make it easier, that didn't make it okay, but there was understanding. And she had deep affection, even if they manifest some weakness at that time. Okay? So we'll chant. Can I? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Is there a fucking healthy eater? Like, a mother couple, uh, a mother lion, or you know, try to cut the, you know, don't do that, or Jesus knocked over the camera. Okay, what anger here doesn't mean admonishing someone or raising your voice in a chastisement or directing or trying to prevent something from happening. Anger is when you actually begin to lose control. And you begin, what will always happen, you will say things that hurt. You will say things that you will later regret if you are intelligent. If you're unintelligent, you'll pretend that (laughs) and try to bury the regrets. But we're talking about when a person actually loses their intelligence and, and begins to act in, in a, and usually in a violent way. So just raising your voice. I mean, if you got kids, you all know that sometimes you got to raise your voice. It doesn't mean you start screaming at them, but you know, sometimes you need to raise your voice. And that is not considered anger. Anger was, was really a loss of intelligence when you become so overcome by emotion that you begin, you know, throwing stuff around getting physically violent, screaming, just going off saying crazy stuff that's really not going to make anybody's life better. That's the anger that we speak of. And as it's explained, it always leads to a loss of intelligence. If we were intelligent, we would curb that tendency and consider what's the best option here. What's actually going to make something better? I mean, okay, we can go on forever with that one. I got there's a couple of talks online that I've given in the past about anger. You might want to reference those. Could I have a? So we'll just again emphasizing that it is through the process of meditation on transcendental sound that one becomes gifted with actual spiritual vision and begins to see with not only enormous clarity, but it leads to actual enlightenment. So we're going to sing the mantra um, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Hari Om
Thank you very much.